Welcome back to The Big Show. It's Alex Belfield talking to the biggest stars. And my next guest is a man who I've watched on TV for as long as I can remember. He started on the radio. He's got a brand new book out celebrating his life. He's the one and only Dennis Norden. How are you? I'm uh, fine, thanks. Yes, thank you for inviting me on. Thanks so much for sparing the time to talk to us today because it must be great to be you because everybody knows you, don't they? I'm, I'm not one of those faces that is universally recognised. I don't know why it is. And I don't, you know, immediately have people rushing up and saying, will you sign this? They vaguely seem to vaguely place me as someone they've had in their front room <laughs> um, without quite locating it on the television. So I've had people come up and saying, weren't you Millie's boy? <laughs> and then somebody asked me if my if their dry cleaning was ready, you know. So, <laughs> so you do have a, sort of a, a one-remove familiarity. And you have a tremendous voice and a way of speaking that's completely unique. Have you always had that? Were you born with it? Yeah, well, that's strange <laughs> because you don't I, you don't hear your own voice because you're inside it. <laughs> so it it doesn't seem to me in any way individual. Never has. Let's go right back to the beginning because I've been reading all about you and your bargain. You've got this new book out, which we're going to talk about in a moment. And what a fascinating start it was. What made you the star you are today? Was it the army or was it the radio? I, I started as a cinema manager, you know, in the days when, when cinemas are not the kind of East German interrogation blocks that they look like today, when they were really palaces, you know, and we, we had, we showed two feature films and a stage show and a newsreel and a cartoon and uh, organ interlude and trailers, and you got all that for six months, four hours of entertainment. So that's where I started writing. I actually started writing the text for organ, is cinema organ interludes. Now, the cinema organ is not often heard in the land these days. Um, people tend to, quite a lot of people, loathe it. But back then, and I'm talking, what, 1939, 1940, it was the loudest musical instrument around. It was the loudest noise people heard that had any kind of music in it. And they were very popular and uh, enjoyed regular radio broadcasts and and back then the the cinema the organ interludes as they were called um, were about 15 minutes anything between 7 and 15 minutes long and they were illustrated by slides the theme of each one every week was illustrated by slides and i started writing by writing text for cinema organ slides. Now, not many practitioners of that particular art still around, actually, but it is a kind of screenwriting when because they were projected on a screen. And um, they were uh, either uh, about some theme, Albert Gems from Albert Catelby or something, or more, more usually, they were what used to be called community singing, what are now called sing-alongs, and I would write parodies of the popular songs of the day. And so that was the first time I'd essayed comedy writing in the, you know, it was the first time I heard audiences laughing at something I'd made up. Did you always have a funny bone then? Did you always, were you always able to see the funny side of life? I don't know. I, it, 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 it's very difficult that to answer, because I think um, you're very much conditioned physically. I mean, I'm was six foot uh, two and three quarters when I was 13. <laughs> so I, my body was, was because it was a, a generation when people weren't as tall as they are today. It's very noticeable. So I spent most of my teenage and early years in kind of in the form of a question mark to kind <laughs> of, you know, kind of diminish my height. And I suppose that is something that, that uh, makes you take a somewhat oblique look at things. I was never a comedian. I was in the RAF, actually, and, and to uh, establish concert parties or reviews or whatever to strengthen the troops' morale. I don't know what I, so I volunteered to write for one of those shows. One of our earliest auditionees was a mill hand from uh, Oldham called Eric Sykes. So I started, as it were, with a strong cast to write for, and I never had any intention of being a performer. I don't think I ever was a performer, actually, but I soon found out that if I wrote the shows, I stayed back at headquarters while these 
concert parties, reviews, went out and toured all round uh, and had a whale of a time. So I always then started to write in little bits of myself to get off guard duty. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then, then after the war, there was radio. Uh, we all came out. There was a whole generation that came out. There was there was Eric, Eric Sykes, and Spike Milligan, and Bob Monkhouse. And, you know, there was a period in my, around about the 70s or 80s when I, and when I got into writing for conferences. There were a lot of conferences took place. They were wonderful for writers, comedy writers, because um, they they spent you know thousands on putting on these shows to motivate their sales staff and so on. And if you wrote something that rhymed, they thought it was genius. You see. <laughs> so we milked that for all we were worth. But then, but they, I remember one we were, I was writing one for IBM, and I'd written a lot of sketches in in this particular show and the marketing director got cold feet about it on the night before the thing was supposed to be shown to to this vast multinational sales staff and he said to me are you sure this is funny <laughs> and i said to him if i could be sure something was funny ibm would be working for me <laughs> so you really don't know all comedy is a risk venture there's no way you can make it otherwise and you have to look at the world from a different perspective how do you know that it's going to tickle people's funny bone and what do you see in your mind that makes it different and stick out you're really probing very deep alex and <laughs> um, i'm squirming a bit here because i don't know you know somebody said somebody once said that, that trying to analyze comedy is like dissecting a rabbit. You can find out how the inside work, but the thing dies in the process. So I think all <laughs> all writers are are a bit timid about trying to go too deep to find out how it happens, because if they finally find it, it'll stop <laughs> happening. You know, um, we always used to say, you know, when people used to say to us. Um, the, the, these kind of probing philosophical questions that you are worth to ask, <laughs> obviously. Um, what is comedy? The chief end of comedy is to make people merry. And we would then add another quotation that we attributed to Victor Hugo, which is, the world needs more merry people and less miserables. And let's talk about comedians generally, because nobody knows comedy more than you. Who was the funniest comedian ever? Oh, yeah. And you want to know what is the purpose of life while we're, at, <laughs> while we're at? Who was the funniest comedian ever? I think as funny as anybody, and I, I make this book in, in the book, um, Clips from a Life, I would award the palm to a man called Bud Flanagan. Um, you see, the trouble is these people are not preserved Another marvellous comedian was Sid Field. Now, he exists on film in two films, London Town and Cardboard Cavalier, neither of which do him any justice at all. It's as though his performance was has an embalmed quality to it. But he was the man who reached out to audiences. And how do you judge who was the funniest comedian ever? by the contentment and happiness on an audience's face as they come out of the theatre and so on. He did the most for audiences who paid to see him of anybody that I ever came across. And there's a difference between the cleverest and the funniest, isn't there? I think probably Bob Munkas would be in the cleverest because he was such a quick man. Bob was possibly the best technician of humour that I ever came across. There was nothing that he couldn't do absolutely uh, first in a first rate manner but he wasn't in himself funny he was a marvelous writer in fact towards the end of his days we, we used to have a thing he was trying to find what he called the ultimate joke that is to write a joke that is so funny that once you've heard it you never hear and need to hear another joke if you want to laugh you just think back to this joke <laughs> that'll do you for the rest of your life you see in you know in the last couple of years of life whenever we met i would say to him how are you getting on with the ultimate joke <laughs> and the last thing he told me he says i've got the first line of it which is a man went into a chemist shop 
<laughs> and when you are a writer, help me with this, because most people in show business have a massive ego. You have to be the most selfless guy in the world to offer your material to somebody else for them to get the glory and nobody knows your name. We used to call ourselves comedians laborers. Our job was A, to do jokes that would fit them and B, to find the type of humor that they didn't know they were able to perform make them perform it and from that there is an extra satisfaction which I suppose matches the satisfaction of a performer when he sees an audience rolling about. Now let's talk about the new book which basically has got all your best bits in it. It's called Clips from a Life. Clever title because of course everybody knows you from those clip shows lately don't they? I didn't want to write the usual sort of from I was born of poor but humble you know (laughs) that sort of thing Um, so I just sat down and wrote down my recollection of anything that had particularly impressed or interested or amused me during the course of my working life you see it's a kind of a work and I made a kind of worksheet which went from the very first thing I wrote right you know and, and and was connected with right the way through to the last it'll be all right on the night type type of thing and then it came out as something like 250 or 60 disconnected bits of text or prose and it was so much like the clips that we used to get in which used to arrive in this sort of disordered jumbled non-chronological form that that I called it clips from a life we we had it assembled in some kind of vaguely chronological order though I'm pleased to say that it is one of the rare books where my childhood is only chronicled in the last chapter. (laughs) Reading your book made me want to live your life because you've been so lucky to have worked with so many people and done so much. Yeah I have a thing about nostalgia I did for for 14 years for Thames Television a nostalgia series called Looks Familiar in which specialised was located in nostalgia for the 30s and 40s. Nostalgia I tend to resent when it takes a form of regret, you know, things were much better then than they are now. As you say, the the fun that I had, the, the things that brought suddenly brought me up short the first time I encountered any from the first time, you know, encountered could be the first time I encountered avocado pears, for example. <laughs> well, I remember I can recall the first time Marks and Spencer stocked avocado pears <laughs> and nobody knew what to do with them, you know. And so they sold them with uh, a little pamphlet. Which you, and they recommended that what you do is you cut them in half, take the stone out, and fill the holes with dry sherry. Because I go back to days when there was only one Chinese restaurant in London that I knew. I mean, apart from Limehouse, but in the West End, uh, there was a Chinese restaurant in Water Street, and nobody else had ever. And so that I, I, I remember thinking to myself, if my parents ever heard us heard us say something like i'm going out for a chinese they wouldn't know what we were talking about <laughs> what was the funniest line you ever wrote and the line that you're most proud of we wrote a line as the funniest line in in movies and we re- actually wrote it uh, it was borrowed from us by talbot rothwell who wrote the carry on films because we had originally ri- written it for a sketch in Take It From Here, which was a radio series that Frank and I wrote, Jimmy Edwards, as a historical character, complaining of how he'd met with treachery, and and he said, infamy, infamy, they've all got it in for me. Now, that was then said by Kenneth Williams in a carry-on film and was um, got an award of some kind, as, as the funniest line. For us, the funniest line in movies ever, uh, which we didn't write, was written by Val Guest for a film called um, Oh, Mr. Porter for uh, a comedian called Will Hay, in which he played the part of a station master who took over. It was an um, adaptation of a play called The Ghost Train, and he comes to this deserted railway station all run down and unkempt and dis- absolutely nobody about goes onto the platform there's a closed ticket window and he knocks on it and the face of an actor called Moore Marriott who was a played a, a very elderly man 
with wisps of white hair and only one tooth in his mouth <laughs> who lifted up the shutters and said, next train's gone. And put it there. now... That's the best comedy in three words that we ever came across. <laughs> and does comedy work as well visually for you as it does on the radio? Because there's still something very special about radio comedy, isn't there? Well, you know, the, the thing that they call radio the theatre of the mind and, and uh, people saying they prefer radio to radio plays to television plays because the costumes and the scenery are better, you know. <laughs> that, well, that, 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 I think every writer prefer, who writes from both mediums prefers radio to television because your radio is a kind of dialogue. You supply half of the experience. You supply what goes in people's ears. Then they clothe it in their minds. And so you're, it, it is, in, in that sense, you're working with the audience. Television tends to be more of a monologue. You put it in front of them, and that's that's what it is, you know. So, so I'm of a generation, we were very verbally oriented, and um, we tend to admire people who do physical comedy, like, as I say, Sid Field, Max Wall, that type of person. Well, you retired a couple of years ago, and here you are back with this book, and congratulations to you on it. It's a fantastic insight into your life and into your history, and what a life you've had. It's just so fascinating, the people you've written for and the people you've worked with. And then, of course, this new generation is still watching you on YouTube with It'll Be All Right on the Night. <laughs> I like doing It'll Be All Right on the Night. I love the idea of this this going on YouTube, just blithely putting these clips on. <laughs> if you knew how many clearances we had to do to get the people in those before we could put them in the show or on the screen. And now this YouTube blithely puts it on without it, you know, having to ask anybody's permission at any time. And nobody gets paid, do they? Nobody gets paid. In, our, in, in, in It'll Be All Right and That, everybody got paid. All the actors who made mistakes, we would ask them, can we show this clip? Uh, this outtake of you making a mistake if they said yes they got paid a fee if the program was repeated they got paid another fee if the prog if that particular clip was borrowed for an overseas version of it'll be all right on the night because it, it wound up with every country in the world doing their own version of it they could get, get paid again and again and again and we used to say it, it, it was like a farm where the farmer earns more from the manure than from the cattle. You know. <laughs> and, of course, the two things we know you for from that show was the clipboard and your delivery of what you read out. Was the clipboard just because you needed notes or was it there to be your catchphrase, if you like? No, my clipboard... <laughs> it was a question I was most frequently asked. What is written on, on the clipboard? Why do you, why do you hold the clipboard? When we recorded It'll Be All Right on the night, we used to record it in, in th three pieces, you know, because of having to put the commercials in. And I used to ask the audience during the breaks, you know, is there anything you'd like to know? And invariably they say, why do you always carry the clipboard? And I used to tell them the honest truth. It's because I'm not a natural performer and I never know what to do with my hands. And I said this one week, and somebody from the audience says, yeah, you ever thought of putting them over your mouth? <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations on being you. Thank you again for writing the book. It's a real insight into your life. It's called Clips from a Life, and uh, Dennis Norden is the author. And thank you for talking to us on the programme. Thank you, Alex.